Welcome to the Road to Jesus with Pastor Fred here at St. James Lutheran Church in Marion, Indiana. Today we are looking at Jeremiah chapter 51, and then we're going to cover the book of Lamentations, and then go to Ezekiel chapter 15. So, um, remembering from last week um, about what Jeremiah is describing, the destruction of Jerusalem, well in Jeremiah 51 we get a very long description of the eventual destruction of Babylon. By, by, the, by Cyrus, you know, the, the, the Medes and the Persians. And he leaves nothing out. It's an extremely long chapter that's worth reading. Um, it goes into great detail. Very interesting and destructive, I guess you could say. In Jeremiah 52, the last chapter of the book of Jeremiah, we get a review of the history of how what led up to Jerusalem's fall and how it happened. So it's kind of like a summary at the end and talks about how they burned the temple and everything. And, and that's how the book of Jeremiah ends. So, um, you know, you can read the back of the book and kind of get a summary of what happened. Now, next we have the book of Lamentations, which is also written by Jeremiah, same guy, thereby earning Jeremiah the title, The Weeping Prophet. It's a very depressing book. I mean, a real downer. Um, but it has some hope sprinkled in. It's basically Jeremiah weeping over the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, and how horrible it is for all the people. Some of the language, I will warn you, is very graphic concerning specific things that happened to the people. And Jeremiah is looking at his country and his people that he loves, this is his town, this is his people, and seeing this utter devastation, and it causes him great grief. Everything he knew was gone. Everything that was sacred was gone. And the reason for it, <clears throat> well, the sin of Judah, and no matter what he had said to them, um, well, from God, they had not listened. And that's how they ended up. They never listened to Jeremiah's prophecies. We're going to find out other people's prophecies as well. And so it was of their own making, but it causes Jeremiah great grief. So looking at Lamentations, in Lamentations 1, he talks about how lonely the city sits. In other words, it's been destroyed. If you've ever been through uh, one of these Towns has been, you know, wiped out by the meth or opiate crisis, and you drive through them. Uh, Drew through several of those in Ohio, where literally there's nothing, boarded up buildings, and yet you can hear police sirens, but you don't see anybody on the streets. Well, that's kind of what Jerusalem was like. It just was looked like a ghost town. There were people there, but it looked horrible, and that's depressing. In Lamentations too, he talks about how the Lord showed no mercy in destroying the city. And this brings out how great the wrath of God is in punishing sin. In Lamentations 3, though, we get a change. And he talks about how in spite of all of this, the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. So in the midst of all this grief, Jeremiah talks about how the Lord has not completely abandoned them, and that he still loves them, and that he will eventually deliver them. It's kind of like at a funeral, you know, when we're mourning over someone because they've died, and yet we also proclaim the grace of God and hope in the coming resurrection, which is basically what's happening here. The exile would eventually end, and the people would return, and God would, God would restore them, and he would always be their God. In chapter 4, he talks about how the gold has grown dim, and we don't think, tend to think about gold growing dim. I don't know if it actually does, but anyway, in this turn of phrase it does, the gold has grown dim, how basically everything that glittered doesn't anymore, and the glory days are over. How everything that was great is now bad, how everything that was pleasurable is now gone, now it's just suffering. In chapter 5, as Jeremiah laments, he calls on God to restore them, to rescue them, uh, to put them back where they were. This is basically a prayer by Jeremiah. And he says, do not forget us forever. And of course, we know that God doesn't forget them, and he does restore them. But they have to suffer and endure first. Now we move on to the book of Ezekiel, which is, well, a lot different than Jeremiah. Okay, Ezekiel writes about the same time as Jeremiah did, maybe just a tad later. Basically starts off prophesying a few years before the fall of Jerusalem uh, to the Babylonians. And then after the Jerusalem falls, he has another vision of a new Jerusalem, and not just the Jerusalem after the return from exile, but the new heavenly Jerusalem that we're waiting for 
um, at the end of time. So there's a lot of tie-ins between the book of, I, of Ezekiel and the book of Revelation. You're going to hear some similar language in, in interpreting um, the book of Revelation. You have to go back and talk about Ezekiel and also uh, the book of Daniel. So now there are some personal differences between Ezekiel and Jeremiah. It seems that Ezekiel was married and was happy, and Jeremiah was unmarried and, well, <laughs> we can tell from his writings, seemingly continually unhappy. It also seems that Jeremiah was active in Judah uh, during the siege of Jerusalem. And it seems that Ezekiel spent his entire ministry in captivity in Babylon, that he wasn't there. But they do have one thing in common, is that both of them warned those still in Jerusalem that they needed to go into exile because there was no future for them as an independent nation. So before we get started in this book, let's look at some of the characters that we run into. First of all, there's Ezekiel. The Lord addresses him several times as, as the son of man, uh, which is basically uh, an Aramaic expression in this instance that means weakness and a humble creature. Ezekiel is also called to be the shepherd of God's flock. He is also a priest, not just a prophet, so he has official duties. And then there's the cherubim, and these are angelic beings that support God's throne, and they play a passive role in the story, but they basically show and magnify the glory of God. Then there are the exiles, and these are the receivers of the prophecies, basically the people of the nation of Judah. Well, chapters 1 through 3 are pretty dramatic. Uh, we see these living creatures with four, wing, four heads and wheels, and these are the cherubim. In these chapters, God calls and commissions Ezekiel to be his prophet and to speak for him. Ezekiel, again, is a priest, and God calls him to explain to the people why the exile is coming. And Ezekiel gets to see God in all his glory with these cherubim, and so then he can explain it to the people. Ezekiel is also called the watchman for the house of Judah, who should be warning them of the coming destruction so that they can repent. And we'll hear more about this watchman later on and its responsibilities. In chapters 4 and 5, we see Ezekiel called to use object lessons uh, for the people. He does these weird physical and material things that... Um, uh, kind of uh, that paint a picture for the people of how God feels. You kind of got to read it to understand it. And so God wants the people to know he's taking no prisoners, and if they don't listen to him, there are going to be some severe consequences. In chapter 6 through 7, the warning continues to go out, but God also declares salvation for those who repent. The message points us forward to the Messiah, who is Jesus, who will save them. In Ezekiel 8 through 11, Ezekiel witnesses four abominations that represent syncretism basically combining true faith with false beliefs and, and then also outright rejection of the true faith. We also see the glory of the Lord leaving the temple, which is pretty scary. I mean, God has left the building. Not a good thing. And the chapters describe God's complete destruction of the people, and only those who are bearing the mark of salvation on their foreheads will be saved. Kind of gives us, again, that revelation picture, right? Jerusalem is compared to a cooking pot with meat in it. And when Ezekiel cries out because of uh, all the elders being killed, we then get a gospel message, thankfully. God will not completely destroy his people. He will save a remnant. In chapters 12 through 15, we see the deportation of Judah symbolized by Ezekiel packing his bags, basically his luggage, no joke, and, 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 and heading out, like, time to go. And the false prophets are condemned who keep prophesying peace when there is no peace. Ezekiel points out that even Jerusalem will not be spared and that God is going to put them to the sword and to fire. Lastly, Jerusalem is called a useless vine that provides nothing. So that's kind of the end of where we're at uh, this week. Next week, we're, gonna, we're going to cover Ezekiel chapter 16 to Ezekiel 33, some pretty good stuff. Ezekiel is always interesting to read. Um, um, just the, the pictures that are painted and the language is just uh, fascinating. So thank you for joining us for the walk, um, the, the walk or the road to Jesus and from Marion, Indiana, and we'll see you next week. Peace out.